one bloodbath of the Battle of Verdun. And this place has special personal meaning because here, one of my relatives, Leo Kluverkorn, was a commanding officer who took this fort, which was a tremendous achievement and it was at a great cost to human life for the German army and French. And wherever you go here in Verdun, you can see what a terrible mess this was for young lives. The Germans managed to capture several forts here at Verdun. Fort de Mont and this one, Fort Vaux. There were 19 forts in total and there were some 400,000 wounded and over 300,000 deaths on both sides. In Leo Kloverkorn's book, Deutscher Wille unter flatternden Fahnen, Fort Vaux, he writes, With Verdun, the frontline soldier associates achievement of physical as well as mental prowess. Unlike any other battle of World War I, and for that matter, any battle in history in which such acts of performance were expected of its fighting forces. When I report on the circle embattlements, and Fort Vaux, I do so with unique authority as I was the commanding officer of the first company of the battalion which stormed the fort and I remain the only surviving company commander. Leo writes that the forts, some 20 or so, encircling the city of Verdun were further enhanced via a maze of defensive trenches, barbed wire and machine gun nests, each built on high ground to command the landscape. The Fort of Vaux, he writes, had very effective concrete ceilings, which after their construction between 1881 and 1884 had received one and a half meters of extra concrete provisioning and had a thick layer of sand wedged between them to dissipate energy. The heaviest German artillery could not impregnate Vaux. He continues, at the beginning of 1916, the Crown Prince's 5th Army prepared to attack Verdun. The attack front was some 20 kilometers in length and well camouflaged, such that the French were taken by complete surprise. The weather was terrible. Rain and snow made the advance of our cannons impossible. Only on the 20th of February did the weather clear. Finally, we can attack. In the morning of the 21st of February, the first 42 centimetre mortar was fired from the railway station at Verdun, followed by the organs of fire of a further 1,250 of our cannons, which fired unanimously with precision timing. The earth trembled. The battle of men commenced. He continues writing about the forest battles, the German capture of Fort Daumont of massive French counter-offensives which took the Germans by surprise. He reports that the 19th Reserve Infantry Regiment, despite heavy French resistance, took parts of the town Vaux and using the initiative stormed up the hill to take the primary trenches of Fort Vaux, only then to be completely demolished by their own German artillery bombardment who had fired their artillery at the agreed time not knowing the Germans were being pommeled by friendly fire. The next disaster was not only of human toll, but grave embarrassment. A field message from Rittmeister von Scheele was misunderstood to mean he had, with the assistance of the 9th Reserve and 6th Infantry Regiment, taken Fort Vaux, when in reality his message read he had advanced to the fort. The misread message led to the Germans' jubilant victory celebration and Rittmeister von Scheele receiving the Pour le Merite from the Crown Prince. When the next day all realized the grave error and Fort Vaux, having resisted all German attacks, the embarrassed von Scheele, eager to prove his worth, stormed the fort at all costs and died with his men. As you can see, a frontal attack on these French forts was effective suicide. And it wasn't just a human toll. Thousands of horses also lost their lives in the battle around Verdun. These terrible events led to the urgent necessity to take Fort Vaux. And this urgent mission 
was entrusted to the 50th Infantry Division. Leo writes, What transpired from March 1916 is unimaginable. Verdun became the human mill. Regiment after regiment was thrown into Verdun and lost. Commanders left in tears in regards to the loss of their once proud regiments. In just the first few months, we counted 175,000 dead on the German side, 190,000 dead on the French side. Over 20 million shells had been fired. The daily bombardment changed the landscape continuously and made soldiers mad. These terrible losses led to the Crown Prince considering a German retreat. The 50th Division, with a strength of 15,000 soldiers, attacked on the 7th of May in the dead of the night, Leo writes. They made it to the moat and were gunned down from the internal defensive bunkers. Again and again attacks were withstood at horrific German losses. Irrespective of losses, the order came to attack once more. The Vaux Hill was engulfed by smoke. On the 2nd of June at 4 a.m., the storm regiments of the 53rd Infantry Regiment and 158th were engaged. The very first frontal assault was to be led by the 1st Battalion. This was made up of the 1st Company under Leo Cloverkorn, the 2nd Company under Gräulich, the 3rd Company under Hase, and the 4th Company under Schäde. Following a massive artillery strike, the 158th was ordered to take the Westmoat Trench of Fort Vaux. The companies were ordered into waves of Storstruppen or stormtroopers, supported by Träger units supplying ammunition whilst the companies were clearing trenches, bringing stick grenades to the last wave intending to use against the French shooting holes of their bunker systems. As the companies attacked, the first company commanders fell as they led their troops into battle. Leo Cloverkorn recalls the charge of Leutnant Köster, who just before shouting to his men, Mir nach, wer kein Feigling ist, or follow me those who are no cowards, was immediately thereafter halved by an exploding hand grenade. The continued push finally saw the four companies take all trenches and moats of Fort Vaux, and two of the companies meeting on top of its observation copula. Company Commander Leo Cloverkorn of the 1st Company of the 1st Battalion of the 53rd Infantry Regiment, the Kölner Kronenregiment or Cologne Regiment of the Crown Prince, was the first to stand on the observation copula of Fort Vaux. To avoid friendly artillery fire, Leo Cloverkorn prioritized the resumption of communication with army remnants outside of the fort. He was able, by way of a message to the machine gunner troop of the 158th Regiment, to inform the Crown Prince not to order an artillery attack on the fort because he was on the fort with his men. The Germans continued to lose significant numbers due to fierce French counterattacks. Unbeknown to Leo Clovercorn, the French commander within the bunker of Fort Vaux was so concerned with the French position he had used his second to last dove to order a French artillery strike on his own fort. Leo Clovercorn and his soldiers were hit by a massive French artillery barrage. Leo Clovercorn received shrapnel wounds through his thigh and his men took Clovercorn into a lower bomb crater for safety and first aid provisions. A French plane, he writes, that was hit by the German artillery in the wing crashed beside him. Days he lay in the crater, wounded, when the first reserve pioneers of the 20th Company attacked. This time with flamethrowers. This was followed by the taking of the fort's armoured doors within its moat by the second company, which was still receiving covering fire from the last remaining troops of Clovercorn's first company holding the top of Fort Vaux. Leo Clovercorn, close to death and stirred only by willpower to fulfill the orders of the Crown Prince, stormed the inner of the fort with the remnants of his first company and elements of the second and eleventh company of the 53rd Regiment. There was fierce fighting in the inner corridors of Fort Vaux with hand grenades on both sides causing terrible mutilations and men being flung backwards by the air pressure wave alone. 
The French kept retreating into the fort, building makeshift barricades, which the Germans took with horrible losses for each meter gained. Leo Cloverkorn countered that whilst the fort was initially designed for an occupancy of 150 soldiers, more than 750 French soldiers had taken defensive positions within Fort Vaux. On the 4th of June, the 53rd and 158th regiments were afforded relief and were replaced by the 126 regiments. Commander of the 15th Army Corps then wrote in his report, The 53rd Regiment is honoured with the accolade with elements of its 1st Battalion as the first to capture parts of Fort Vaux. The 158th Infantry Regiment, which through its uncompromising defence of the fort surrounds, allowed the German army to capture the fort completely. The taking of the rest of the fort was no easy task, with the French heroically fighting over each centimetre and the Germans having to engage fierce flamethrowers by the German fusiliers, the French believing a counter-attack from the outside was imminent. Days of fierce resistance finally ended on the 7th of June when the French commander surrendered. One aspect to the French surrender was that they had run out of water. On the 2nd of June, the French had counted 1,800 litres of water left in their water supply in the fort, but it turned out that this figure was wrong. And the French commander was forced to station armed guards around the water tank to avoid a rush to the water by overwhelmed and exhausted French soldiers. On the 7th of June, 1916, Crown Prince Wilhelm, commander of the 5th Army, presented Major Reynal, French commander of Fort Vaux, with a French officer's sword as a sign of his respect. And this is the exact location of one of the many sketches that Leo Clovercorn undertook. The Germans and French troops had horrible hand-to-hand -hand combat right here within these forts and we can see here that they were breaking up sections just to survive. What is extraordinary is that to this very day the room for the commander, the German commander, has a commentary written in German. Forts, Kommandanten, Zimmer.